this is Dan Turchin, CEO of Insight Finder. At the end of October, I sat down with a group of executives to discuss the future of AI for IT operations. We discussed all of the things you'd expect, you know, geeky stuff like anomaly detection and automated root cause analysis. But it was also a bit of a therapy session. We discussed what makes the CIO's job so hard and why automation is the best way to satisfy the insatiable thirst for tech services to run the business and the unrealistic expectations users have for uptime and performance. At Insight Finder, we're committed to helping enterprise CIOs thrive where most fail. We believe complicated new service architectures and machine data got us into this mess. And the best AI tuned to deliver a better end user experience will get us out of it. Without further ado, listen and learn from some of the best in the business. Mark Settle, uh, born in upstate New York in Rome, New York. Uh, I left Oct about a year or so ago. I've been advising startup companies and frankly having probably too much fun over the last uh, couple of months. I've had an opportunity to work with several VCs as well. Um, and so that's my role. I'm playing an advisory role at the moment, getting to do a fair amount of talking and writing about topics of interest to, to me as well. Biggest ops challenge. So over the course, I'd say like the last six months, I've taken a deep dive into privacy data management and automation tools. Um, I'm trying to put together an automation council next year to kind of look at this whole phenomenon of automation disillusionment. So I think people spend a lot of money, you know, chasing a lot of things that just don't meet the heightened expectations that people have for that technology. But for next year, there's, there's two topics I, I'm going to focus on. And, you know, we can follow up maybe one-on-one -on -one with me and anybody else on the call. I'm um, really interested in the next generation of DLP technologies, you know, and that whole sassy thing that's going on. But I think there, there needs to be a more fundamental rethinking of, of how we think about data loss prevention. And um, these low code development platforms, I find really intriguing because I think, you know, the pendulum has swung so far to SaaS that maybe it's time for it to swing back and you'll see application teams turning out bespoke applications to perform a specific process or to support the activities of a you know, specific kind of a work group. So kind of two research projects that I'm teeing up for next year around DLP and uh, no code stuff, low code stuff. There you go. Because Mark uh, didn't plug his, his own books, I'm going to plug them. So plug two, two, two essential reads uh, for kind of high tech CIOs, Truth From the Trenches came out first and then more recently Truth From the Valley. So because I'm on Mark's advanced PR team, I felt the need to plug those. I'd also outstanding Christmas gifts for, you know, your techie friends that you're struggling to figure out like, what the hell can I give this guy? So there you go. There you go. I didn't catch your quarantine hobby, Mark. Quarantine hobby. Um, I've, I've taken on some reading uh, projects. So, so the one I'm in right now is I'm reading biographies of all the British prime ministers since Robert Walpole in 1720 which is an interesting evolution. Wow, that's admirable. Uh, all right, let's, uh, let's go around the horn. Uh, Sean, you wanna go next? Sure. <clears throat> I'm Sean Barker. I, I, was, uh, I was born in Southern California and lived most of my life there. Um, you know, I, I currently am the CEO of CloudyQ, which is a, uh, a consulting and professional services organization that does all, all cloud-based infrastructure ops, application development, management, um, and managed services. So um, we got onshore and offshore kind of uh, uh, facilities um, in order to keep the cost down. And we're working with a number of uh, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies. So it, it, it keeps us fairly busy. Um, the biggest, the biggest op cha ops challenge that, that, that we kind of face is wading through the sheer number of, of tools and services and SaaS products and things that are available out there to, you know, we, we've locked in on several that, that we like, but tomorrow there's going to be five more that, that come out that do, you know, that also make breakfast and <clears throat> coffee and, you know, cost less and, you know, going down that path. And it's just, you know, getting the right timing for the right service, the right tools, the right processes to, to enable the customers. That's, you know, that's probably one of our biggest challenges. Um, let's see, quarantine hobby. Uh, unfortunately, I think it's been the refrigerator. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> spent most of my time either on my computer or in front of the refrigerator. 
Um, I wish I, you know, I had, had a few more hobbies, but, um, you know, time is, uh, uh, time's a little crazy. As, as you know, you can't tap somebody on the shoulder and say, can you do this? Can you help me? It comes down to now I got to schedule a meeting to have a five minute conversation and because everybody's time is, is blocked up. So the hours get longer. Yeah. Good. Good to have you, Sean. Uh, Ray, you want to go next? Sure. Um, my name is Ray Lippick. I was born in a suburb of Chicago, so a Midwestern fellow, and raised there till I was 18. Uh, then went to the West Coast for 20 years, and now back to the Arkansas area for, I guess it's about 22 years now. Um, work at uh, J.B. Hunt, that small trucking company in Northwest Arkansas, and have the privilege of being the program manager for what we call Digital Workplace and IT operations. And so we, we work hard at uh, kind of end user sorts of stuff. And so things like ITSM tools and AI ops tools are important to us as um, the company has been growing uh, substantially over the last several years and looks to grow a whole lot more in the years to come. We are trying to position ourselves by getting some of those cutting edge tools. And so uh, we, and that's how we actually found Dan and Insight Finder and so uh, looking at some of his tools as well. Quarantine hobby. I would say uh, we've been, I work at home remote at this point since March. And uh, so being at home a lot, you notice things that need to be done. Mm -hmm. So my bride and I have this home to-do list and we've been working it down and it's getting smaller and smaller, thankfully, instead of bigger and bigger. So that's what we've been doing. Good for you. Good to have you here, Ray. Good to be here. Uh, Joe, you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Uh, name is, uh, can you see me? I turned my video. I got my yeah. video thing. Yeah. See me? I got, that might be, not be a good thing. But anyway, um, so uh, yeah, name's Joel Eagle. Uh, birthplace is Fort Sill, Oklahoma. I lived there for 60 days. And then was uh, when the military gave my mom the okay to join my dad in, in, in uh, Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, we, we met him over there. He was deployed there. So my dad's military. So uh, that was my birthplace. Never been back. Never seen Fort Oklahoma. Tried outside a lot in Oklahoma, as I understand it. Um, the company I work for is uh, uh, McDonald's Corporation. Uh, so uh, as, as a career-wise, I ended up, I came to McDonald's from a company on the West Coast. Uh, Southern California, worked there for a number of years. From there, I came from a company in the Southeast, a uh, large uh, healthcare company uh, in, in the U.S. I was spent a lot of time doing that, but ended up at McDonald's through a number of different connections and now been here uh, and living in the Chicago, or actually now living in Chicago uh, for, um, gosh, I think I made that. Oh, I made that move in 2012. Sorry, my brain's got to get caught up. Um, and largely, uh, the role I play today um, I was going to say I had something witty that had something about uh, sleeping in a Holiday Inn Express last night, but I didn't know somebody in Holiday Inn's on the call. But anyway, uh, the role I play today, I think, is a chief cat herder. But um, I run the uh, or I'm responsible for the cloud platforms. So Azure, uh, AWS, uh, we have a little bit of GCP, um, not much, but a little bit uh, uh, as well as our ITSM platform. So we, we call it Service Cafe internally. It's ServiceNow built up with a couple of the capabilities that we have. We bolt together and we refer to that as Service Cafe. Um, I also own uh, responsible for our data movement. So you think of EAI uh, and a number of other type platforms that we use to move uh, data all around the world. So think about uh, transaction level data that moves to and from the restaurant, sales data, uh, uh, POS uh, uh, updates, patching, all that sort of stuff that happens around uh, the restaurants. Um, uh, let me see, what else do I do? Database support, all the database team people that they support there. I'm trying not to leave anybody. I feel like I'm doing an Oscar thing. Um, in, in that space, uh, that's largely uh, my, my remit there. So we do that. Um, biggest ops challenge. I report to the global CTO, by the way. Biggest ops challenge. So. Um, you know, if I think about it, we have uh, the way the McDonald's is set up. You know, we we're not a so we're certainly a global brand, but we don't operate in a we don't operate completely like a global company. We operate a bit like a multinational, and we have a, a, a corporate structure uh, where there's the organization. We talk about having suppliers, which are separate companies, obviously that supply stuff to us, but very integral to what we can deliver. Uh, everything from you know paper to food, etc. 
Uh, and then there's the franchisees, right? So it's the, it's the corporation, the franchisees, and, and uh, the suppliers. We, we know that we call that, re refer to that group as the system. Uh, and it, it's, uh, it's a bit of a challenge to get the system to benefit in most things that we do. So it's a, it, you take a different approach to thinking about uh, suppliers to you or who you serve, whom your customers are, uh, et cetera. But if you just think about the challenges of, from an IT perspective of supporting that environment and supporting uh, it, whether it's, it's data from that or whether you're talking about level one help desk calls or anything that you have going on to support this, all while expected to reduce costs, improve efficiency, move at speed, uh, and do something meaningful and, make, and, and help the company become uh, or be more improve our competitive advantage. Uh, automation comes into play. Right? Everybody keeps asking me, "What are you doing about AI ML?" I, I sometimes want to stop and uh, ask them, "Do you actually know what that means?" Right? Can you say? Can you tell me what AI ML really means? Like the word, the acronym, or you just learn the acronyms now? We moved on. Um, so I struggle with the expectations. I think I'm hearing a little bit of that on the call earlier and here around. What exactly can this do for us? Where can we apply it? Uh, where do we make investments? You know, how do you manage expectations? Um, there's no end to the, uh, the number of things that we can think of or challenges that we, can, we need to overcome. I think for me, the biggest op challenge is when I think about doing things at scale, uh, complexity seems to be the enemy uh, of, of scalability, right? So the, the, the more I'm required to scale something, I, I'm forced to reduce the complexity and reducing the complexity means I'm at this gap where I don't understand the automation, AI technology enough to pull the complexity out. So I'm still reliant on a number of what I'll call them legacy type operational models, whether it's level one, two, three, four support or um, typical uh, uh, ways that we think about um, uh, uh, treating data, uh, stewardship and things like that. So I know that's a, a big bunch of things, but um, for me, it would be how do I pull, how do I achieve scalable results uh, and, and manage complexity, right? And then all the rest of the stuff that goes with that, um, security, et cetera. Quarantine hobby, uh, you know, letting my beard get shabby. Um, um, I like to, uh, I was able to get out to the racetrack a little bit and drive some, so I like doing that. Uh, I often tell people when I'm, when I'm in a car going really fast uh, in a racetrack, uh, I don't think about um, budgets or, performance reviews or any other stuff that we have to deal with on the regular part of our job. Every now and then I think about some automation stuff. I think about how this is the machine that around me is at working, but um, for the most part, I just think about surviving, right? And living through the corner and coming out the other end and doing it well. So that's my hobby. The metaphor for life, Joel. Yeah. Well yeah. said. Uh, good. Warren? Okay. Uh, well, born in Ottawa, Canada, um, many years ago, moved to Toronto and then Phoenix, Scottsdale. And now I live in New Jersey. So that's another discussion, but a reverse migration um, <laughs> right at the uh, peak of the housing bubble. So you know how <laughs> things are going. My, um, my role is working with Dan, love it so far. My, my hobby, biggest ops challenge, I'll skip that one. Um, it's not as interesting as yours. Quarantine hobby was uh, similar to Ray's. I've got a, this to-do list, uh, the supporting technologies. I figured out five different ways to make coffee, you know, French press. I've, I've got a little Keurig. Mm. I've got, you know, a variety of different devices to uh, support my home renovation habit. Nice. Good. Uh, I'll bring us home and then we'll, uh, we'll get deeper into the content. Uh, so born in uh, Westfield, New Jersey just uh, a stone's throw from where Warren is. Uh, CEO of Insight Finder. Uh, Insight Finder is the AI first system of intelligence for IT operations. Uh, I know a lot of you are familiar with the product, but kind of like, uh, you know, the CFO has ERP and the head of sales has CRM and, you know, head of, uh, uh, head of HR has, you know, HCM. Uh, IT operations has Insight Finder. Uh, the biggest challenge that, that we face on a daily basis, it's almost, it's complimentary in one sense, it's, and it's almost the inverse of what Joel talked about. It's helping organizations that understand they have kind of a very abstract mandate to use, quote, AI and ML, figuring out what's the most pragmatic way to onboard automation technology. Um, so get into that in a little more detail. Um, quarantine hobby, um, I've narrowed it down to two. Uh, don't have a, as much time as I'd like for either of these, but uh, I'm relearning my Spanish, which uh, has become 
uh, Moy Mal uh, over the last 30 years. And I'm relearning the piano thanks to my kids who are much better musicians than I uh, probably ever will be. Uh, so that's me. So I thought I'd spend a few minutes kind of framing the discussion, although truthfully, your, your, your tee up of, of your own challenges is certainly um, as relevant as anything that I can share, but, uh, but I get to be on a soapbox for a few minutes and um, I'm passionate about this space. This is something I've been doing for 23 years seven companies in and around, we now call it AI ops, but applying the principles of automation to IT operations. So I thought I'd share kind of my thoughts on where AI technology is, um, what at least I see ahead and kind of call it the next 12 to 15 months. Um, and then some perspectives about, you know, challenges that we're all having just about how to be successful, not with the buzzwords, but operationally, you know, how to implement measure budget for, you know, that sort of thing when it comes to AI first technologies. So a um, little history tour. Uh, like, uh, like, like Mark, I, I like to op open, the, uh, open the time capsule sometimes. I'm not, I'm not doing uh, British prime ministers, but I like to be a student of technology. I'm particularly fascinated by the Luddite movement in uh, the 18th century. Uh, so that's my connection to Britain. Uh, but when it comes to AI, so uh, roll back the clock to the 50s, uh, there was a, uh, a computing society conference at, uh, in, in Hanover, New Hampshire at Dartmouth College. And uh, this, uh, this young, handsome professor named Marvin Minsky, who you see there in the top right, uh, uh, proposed this wild idea that there would be a time when tasks that we think can only be done by humans could actually be done by machines. It was pretty radical. Um, and uh, fast forward to the 70s, it became commercialized. It was kind of the, the, the early days of what we talked about as the, a the first AI summer, massive infrastructure and uh, academic investment in uh, what was then called artificial intelligence. So it was, you know, coin term was coined in 1956, um, but expert systems were basically uh, deterministic workflows, at least that's what we call them now, um, that would solve problems that, you know, filling out forms or, uh, you know, very, stuff is very rudimentary today, but the idea with, that with some conditional logic, basically if then statements, you could build interfaces, you know, before there was really, you know, certainly no desktop computing, but, you know, with, mainframes and punch cards and that sort of thing, you could build some conditional logic and make machines appear to be thinking. Uh, so fast forward uh, to the 80s, the, the uh, technology had become so overhyped, a common theme, that uh, spending dried up, you know, the, the idea that, you know, uh, these systems were going to become sentient, you know, anytime soon was, you know, it was so far-fetched that, uh, you know, everyone kind of uh, backed away from commercializing a lot of these technologies. Uh, in the 90s, uh, kind of the, 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 the renewed enthusiasm of AI, I, I would argue, was punctuated by, uh, by the IBM supercomputer beating Kasparov, actually in only one of three games. So to his credit, Kasparov did win two out of three. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, that sent a message that, you know, something that was always thought to be you know, uh, strategy based and something that, you know, a, a, a machine can never be quote smart enough or, you know, understand enough patterns to play chess. Well, you know, that was an indication that maybe this AI thing was, was going to, was going to work out after all. Um, in the last decade or so, um, a gentleman named Jeffrey Hinton uh, doing work, I think at University of Toronto, uh, essentially commercialized neural networks. So now we talk about deep learning but less about the technology, but more about some of the amazing things that neural nets or deep learning can do. You know, we don't bat an eyelash anymore when, you know, we get accurate recommendations from Netflix or, uh, you know, a Amazon recommends what we need, or, you know, the, the, the Gmail type ahead feature, it recommends, you know, what you're probably gonna wanna type. These are all things that are aided by neural nets that really uh, was the output from research that was done not that long ago. Um, and, you know, I cite Jeff Hinton, but there's certainly 
a, a small but a meaningful cadre of professors that have that have been part of that. Now, if you look at uh, what's up ahead, maybe not in the next decade, but you know, call it the next you know thirty plus years, maybe forty, maybe fifty, depends on who you talk to. Um, we're going to move from the point where we're now at, which is what we call narrow artificial intelligence. So, in a very specific domain, AI can perform well. For example, uh, you know, routing trouble tickets, or for example, you know, determining the root cause of you know an outage. Um, very narrow. So, whether it's supervised using labeled data or unsupervised inferring patterns, um, that's kind of the state of technology. But in terms of kind of you know evolutionarily speaking. The quote smartest AI is probably you know uh, about the intelligence of a nine month old. So you know you're not going to have you know your nine month old you know swinging a bat against Randy Johnson, and you know you're not going to have your nine month old you know doing tests in college. They're nine months old. They you know there there's certain things they do well. In the next thirty to fifty years, you'll see what we call AGI, so artificial general intelligence, and that's where just across a broad set of things that you'd associate with kind of human intuition, judgment, um, we'll actually be able to, uh, to uh, develop systems that can do a lot of those. There, there are a lot of interesting early experiments being done with robotics, trained on neural nets and things like that, but they're still very simple today versus what you're gonna see. Um, I'm a firm believer that at no time in the near future, probably not in the next century, will we encounter kind of a bot apocalypse? Um, because I firmly believe uh, that humans that develop these algorithms um, are, you know, are ultimately um, uh, uh, have the right intentions when it comes to developing these technologies. I think there are gonna be more and more checks and balances up ahead. Um, and I think it'll be a good thing, you know, whether it's for healthcare or education or defense or uh, you know, agriculture, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, eliminating famine. I think these are the problems that are actually going to be solved sooner than, you know, the bots are going to become our overlords. Um, so a little bit of soapboxing, but that's kind of where we've been, I think, where we're headed. Um, we talked about the current state. Now, applying AI to, to you know, where we're at today in IT ops, um, it's, a, it's a complex relationship that, uh, that we as practitioners have with technology. Um, at one point, maybe you know, a decade, 15 years ago, the technologies were a lot simpler, and we finally started to get um, gain control over how to monitor them. And even though the, the monitoring systems were very simple, the applications were very simple too. So kind of simple heartbeat monitors, things like that were sufficient. Well, now what happened is the pace the, uh, of, of technology complexity is so far outpacing our ability to monitor and manage these systems that all of a sudden, you know, IT ops went from looking like heroes and being able to, you know, keep up with, with all of the kind of the, the digital exhaust from these systems. And now they're just woefully inadequate. And so everyone's kind of scrambling to figure out in the, you know, in the context of, you know, microservices and CI CD architectures and, you know, dozens of API calls to external systems. Like how do we make sense of all of the new, uh, failure points that have been introduced into these systems. And so that's where, you know, you start to get to this need for a more intelligent approach to managing systems at scale. So I'm, I'm convinced we're getting there. I'm maybe a little, little biased, maybe a little Pollyanna-ish, but I think if we look at each kind of element of the service health life cycle, there are really interesting mm -hmm. new technologies, kind of AI first technologies that are being introduced to uh, you know, improve the ability of mere mortals to manage these complex systems. So if you look at monitoring, so increasingly um, smart anomaly detection is being used to kind of suppress noise. Uh, so you have a manageable number of actionable alerts, event management. So being able to actually do anomaly detection across different types of data, we could never do that before, but now we can look across traces and events and logs and metrics and uh, et cetera, and be able to actually make some sense uh, using uh, typically unsupervised machine learning because there's too much data to, to label it, but using unsupervised machine learning across all these types of, uh, of data sources makes some sense out of what's going on, which makes incident management a lot more practical.
So we can actually use AI to predict when the next incident is gonna happen and what's the most likely cause of it. So when we look at remediation, uh, we may not be at the point where you want the machine or the AI to auto remediate because there's a lot of risk and there is, you know, there are a lot of different patterns that can occur, but we're getting closer to the point where kind of the input from the AI, the machine fused with the input from the human, you know, in an ops context, you're going to be able to see pretty accurate uh, root cause analysis just based on a little bit of judgment and, you know, rational thinking from humans fused with the ability of AI to be able to, you know, kind of distill the universe of possible root causes down to maybe two or three. Um, and then lastly, continuous learning. So that's really the strong suit of AI is being able to, to detect when a pattern associated with historical outages is about to recur, uh, the, the learning from the past experience, who was involved, what action did they take, how long did the outage last, you know, these you know, three or four variables, build those into this learning model. And all of a sudden, before monitoring detects an issue, this continuous feedback and continuous learning loop kicks in and says, hey, you know, here's something you could do proactively to prevent an outage that's otherwise going to happen. Now, I told you I'd, I'd do a little bit of prognosticating before we jump into the round table. Um, I see three key patterns and kind of, you know, talk a little bit about the evolution of AI, but three things that I see happening even in the next 12 months. Um, and feel free to call me out a year from now if, if I get the timing wrong, but, uh, but three things that I feel like are imminent, um, you know, not on the order of a decade, but closer to on the order to, of a year to, to you know, a couple of years. So I think in the workplace, um, what we now think of as intelligence is going to become ambient. So you walk into a conference room, eventually we will be back in conference rooms um, and, you know, it detects, you know, who you are. So, you know, what temperature you like the room to be at. And if you book a conference room and there are more people invited than can, you know, be accommodated by the room, then you'll get, you know, an intelligent notification saying you need a bigger room and here's one that's available. Um, you know, now we talk about things like contact tracing. So, there's going to be a lot of AI technology applied to making workplaces seem smart because they're going to know, you know, where it's okay to gather and where it's not okay to gather. And, you know, one big problem that, that, uh, that, you know, everyone is going to face as they return to work is if only, if a building's only allowed to be at certain capacity, how do you stage who can be in the building when, and, and literally how do you schedule the elevators so that we're not waiting, you know, an hour because everyone's, trying to you know, uh, go, go up in a crowded elevator at the same time. These are all things where um, you know, these are problems that are gonna get solved by lots of data and interesting algorithms. And it's gonna seem like just a smart workplace, but it's all, you know, all supported by data and AI. Uh, so a big issue that we're, we're, everyone in the kind of AI first industry is facing is how do you uh, train AI algorithms without training them to be biased? And, um, this is everyone's problem, and it's probably bigger than we realize. Um, I can give you an example. You know, the, the world that I've been in, IT ops and IT service management, if a model is getting trained on, let's say, which vendor is the most effective at fixing a problem, and in the training data, most of the data is represented by, you know, call it large global brand name vendors, just for simple, you know, equipment maintenance. Well, what you're going to do is tell the model uh, inadvertently that, you know, large co is more effective at fixing these problems than maybe, you know, the small local minority owned business. So no one intended for that algorithm to have a bias against minority owned business. But if you train the data on what, what's actually out there, the, the large companies are more represented in the data. So we're going to start to see kind of you know, universal, you know, kind of regulation frameworks for how you judge the quality of AI with respect to, you know, simple examples like that. Um, and that applies to, you know, AI making decisions about who goes behind bars, you know, what, how, how much risk is, uh, you know, is, is this sentence for this uh, convicted criminal, things like that. Uh, it, you know, if we don't create these regulatory frameworks, you're going to see there is the potential for dangerous decisions to get made and for those decisions to reinforce subsequent uh, 
AI first interactions, but I think we're going to, as a society, I think we're going to get really good at judging AI. And then lastly, um, I think it was Mark uh, alluded to low code environments. Um, in, in my, my humble estimation, um, I see in the next 12 to 18 months, low code environments winning in terms of, you know, we talked about the cliche of the citizen developer, but I think what we have traditionally called coding is going to become a commodity because the low code systems are getting so, uh, so efficient and, you know, they're so adept at making everyone essentially a programmer. I think that the future of what we've called programming is really the quality of your thinking with regard to machine learning and data science. So I think, you know, the, the ML developer is the new programmer. And I, I see that happening rapidly. Again, I'm biased. I spent four years at service now. It's a, you know, um, a very popular low code platform, but seeing the power of what you can do today with no C, no Python, typically not even any JavaScript. Um, and, and, you know, playing that out, you know, 12 to 18 months, it's pretty clear that um, at no time in the near term future will the skills required to develop and train machine learning algorithms be outsourced to machines to write or train the algorithms on their own. So I think that's going to become the new, um, uh, the new kind of point of demarcation when it comes to evaluating technical skills and also what the market's willing to pay for. Um, these skills are in high demand, uh, short supply. Okay, so I told you a little bit of me soapboxing. Um, I do want to use the balance of the time, which is too little, um, to have a discussion. And I, I thought I'd start with um, your perspectives on, you know, we talked a little bit about what the technology can do, but you know what? Your employees don't care about what the technology can do. They just care about does it or does it not solve a problem they have. So we'd love to hear your perspectives on if you're using the technology today, how, and how do you think about what are the right business problems to solve with AI? So Dan, this is Joel. Uh, I'll, I'll go in. You know, we, we, were, we started down the path with you a while back doing the auto, uh, auto routing of trouble tickets, you know, uh, based on, uh, you know, level one help desk, people, people interacting with, with the help desk. And then they could, they could, we started to improve our, our ability to understand what we're doing there, auto route tickets. Um, you know, the, the, the beginning of that was all about, Hey, we can, we can reduce costs, improve efficiency, but ultimately it's about, it's about um, improving that customer experience right around what we're doing. Uh, today we are trying to, uh, you know, I have this, I have this uh, bent that I'm on. I call it no ops, right? I'm trying to get to the point where even though I'm responsible for what would be, you know, a lot of infrastructure uh, area with cloud, the interaction to it, particularly from our legacy environments that I'll say, I'll call it back office and legacy that we put into uh, largely the Azure environment. Uh, you know, it's still, it's the people who operate those and the, the contracts they have for suppliers and like that still reflect the, the world of, of the data center, right? As you know, McDonald's is, is um, in fact, by the end of this year, uh, we will be at a, um, all of our compute will be cloud-based with the exception of uh, an AS400 that we have to worry about uh, at a mainframe, but everything else is in the cloud, right? And I'm going to shoot the mainframe. It's the last thing I do. And I'm going to, it's, it's, it'll be dead by the end of, end of next year. But anyway, the point is, it is, it, you know, for me, it, it comes back to I, I need to improve this self-service capability to the point where either I'm using uh, low-code type uh, applications where I can build uh, self-service, right? So I can say I need to understand, you know, cobble together from technology a capability. The capability then needs to be consumable. And in order to do that, I've got to have some amount of, whether you want to call it, artificial or autonomous or some way of handling variability, right? And the way somebody wants to engage with that, right? So the, 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 you know, part of the example I like to use is, you know, when I, when I talk to people, particularly internal to the cut to the organization, you know, I ask them, you know, the minute they want me to do something or change something or put some technology in or build some portal or build a capability for them. It's about organizational change management. It's about training. It's about all these things that you have to go off and do and explain the complexity of all of it. And I'm saying, how do I get to the point where I'm just an app on your phone and you like the app because it does something for you. So you download it and you use it and you don't actually call up, you know, American or United or Delta to figure out how to use the app. You don't call your bank, to figure out how to use the app. You just download it and you use it because you want to. This is the, to me right now, if I could get to that, that's my holy grail of, you know, the, whatever, the Terminator or whatever, the bots, right? It's like, I have, we, we can 
we can just put capability out there on a platform that has the ability to then start learning and understanding how to overcome the exceptions to make the exceptions a, hand, a, a, a way I can automate the handling of exceptions. This accelerates then the, cap- the, the ability to provide that, that, that level of, I'll call it ease, right? Or customer experience. That, that's where I'm trying to get to. And I have no clue how to do it at the moment. Good example. So, um, so you know, I, I agree with Joel on, on the on the, the the no ops portion. I think I think we're looking at you know less ops, right? And we're, and we're <laughs> Sounds like an ops guy talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, most of most of the engagements that we're doing today are really focused on how do we automate everything um, and and make life you know, work through a CI CD pipeline and, and do DevOps and really enhance the ability to go fast and and remediate, you know, issues as they come about within application development or or what have you. I think I think as we move towards um, um, low code apps, I think that will get better. Um, Dan, I think I think we're a little further out, um, mostly because of the transition time that it's going to take um, to to do the change management, to do the adoption, to do you know the shift from what 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 customers and companies have today over to a low code option. Um, but you know m- many of the the companies or, or engagements we have are, are not only doing automation, but they're looking you know a bit more forward towards AI and ML and how do we how do we take all this automation that we've done and now auto remediate problems within the the ops environment what are the what are the right algorithms and and it's going to be you know kind of in the same way we've always done things to say what's what's the low-hanging fruit and how do we how do we eliminate those things first um i do think we'll we will struggle with bias right because we'll you know we'll we'll structure things off well everything starts out structured off what you know and then divide uh, biases develop but i think over the the long run um, you know, I think we can get there and, and to, you know, to Joel's point, if, if, the, if the long term becomes an app that you just know how to use and do it because you want to, um, that makes it that much better for, you know, for the customer or the client or, or the constituents within that client. Make sense? Yeah, Ray, I'd love to hear your perspective. Uh, you know, we, we've known each other a long time, but I know your team was very intentional about picking a business problem. How, how was that discussion uh, internally? The drill of it is the, the company has been growing over the last several years and we have older technology in place that needs to be upgraded so that as we continue to grow, the technologies that we have in place can do some of the things that you were actually talking about earlier. And that is uh, be able to identify a problem when you have multiple uh, tools in place that are coming up, monitoring things, but coming up with alerts and well, which one is the biggest issue right now and how do we get to root cause fast? So we have some of these systems in place, Dynatrace, Hop, and SolarWinds, and they have lots of alerts at times. So what do you do quickly to address it so that it's the maximum efficiency and effectiveness for the company while the company is growing both in capacity, capability, but also people? And uh, which means more alerts and more things going on. Um, and then we've obviously been thinking through how do, how do you measure that as well? So we've been looking at metrics and revamping and rethinking what's the best metrics that we need to look at. Um, that has been morphing and changing, we hope improving, but uh, it's all connected, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a challenge. So uh, how to be more efe- efficient and effective at what we're doing is the, is the bottom line in the, uh, in the operations world. So we oversee, I oversee uh, seven different towers, all end user uh, related. And so we care a whole lot about how the operations work, but uh, need to be more efficient at it. So. What tools ITSM wise, what AI ops tools, which ones work best together? Is a platform better than point tools? Uh, those are questions we have uh, been looking at very carefully over the last 
a couple of years, but very intentionally over the last three or four months and trying to come to some conclusions even at that. Mark, I'm not sure if that answers your question, Dan. But yeah, no, 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 good, good perspective. That's why I wanted you to, you to chime in on that. Um, Mark, you interact probably with more CIOs than anyone. Um, these kind of challenges that you guys have been discussing, are those the, the ones that you typically hear around you know, m- making the business more successful? Or wh- what do you think is keeping CIOs at night these days? On the, on the upside, you know, most people are migrating to the cloud. Um, many are using dual provider solutions. They have maybe one set of apps up on Azure and another set on AWS. Um, Flexera published an interesting report. There's very little cross-use of management tools between different clouds. So when people are supporting hybrid cloud environments, you know, your team has got to develop some sophistication around multiple tools. Um, you know, maybe some of the kind of technologies we're talking about here could smooth over some of those differences or provide some kind of a you know, more common front end in terms of triaging, et cetera. But the, the ease of spinning up infrastructure on demand is so great these days, like you alluded to before the complexity that, um, you know, everybody bitches about they're spending more money than they expected in the cloud. And it's because they really don't know how to like turn stuff off and use it effectively. There's that issue, you know, and then there's the, the unbridled data replication that occurs with all of the security and privacy problems that that can lead to as well. And enforcing regulatory controls, you know, so automated procedures, um, one of the great things about automated procedures is they provide the kind of evidence that auditors are looking for in many cases that controls have been upheld as well. So, so when, if you turn a whole bunch of software guys loose and say, here's your AWS, you know, sandbox, get your toys out and like, go have fun, you know, think things get out of control, can get out of control pretty quickly. So I, I think there's a lot of concern, you know, in that kind of area, but just as a, a bottom line, I mean, any transactional process, whether it's security alerts or server alerts or uh, storage volumes or network traffic or whatever, you know, I think lends itself to the use of AI tools to provide more quality assurance. Joel, you brought up at the beginning, there's not really a shared definition of what AI and ML are. I'd be curious to get everyone's perspective on what, what the business is expecting. What does AI mean? What it, what does the business think IT and IT ops is doing with AI? And, and then the, the, the reverse of that question, do you think those expectations are reasonable? I can certainly speak from our side when it comes to the business. Uh, AI ops means uh, sort of like this magic poof dust that you are able to sprinkle onto uh, operations and all of a sudden everything is fixed fast. Uh, that would be a, a perspective from some. Uh, those that look at it a little bit closer realize that is that is not reality. And so the other side of it is um, some think that, like you said, this is going to be a long time coming. So why even spend too much time, effort, energy, and money investing in it until it's better down the road? So we, we sort of have two spectrums that we deal with. Yeah. Yeah. For, for go ahead, Sean. No, go ahead. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm I'm with uh, I'm with you definitely. The poof dust um, that you know makes everything better, I think, is the expectation. I think there's still a great deal of of effort that needs to take place, and investment that needs to take place in in making AI really efficient for for companies. I mean, you can go collect all the telemetry data, and you know you you have the you know you have the what, right? And then then you need to work through the, you know, so what, through all that data and slim it down to what can you do with it, which becomes the, the now what, right? So as you, as you look to gather the data and, and get it to get smarter about, you know, what's going on and, and how to find these things and which things to suppress and which not to suppress, you know, there's, there's time, effort, energy, and money to invest there. Um, and and it's not going to be magic poof dust for for quite some time, but I think it will be, you know, I think it's going to get get continue to get better. And um, as we as we go forward, that that level of investment and understanding and maturity in the in the overall uh, AI and ML world will really help the organizations long term. But I, I don't think it's going to solve the problem, you know, immediately today in an instant, which is I think the expectation of of those who are writing checks, right? 
It is, Sean. In fact, this number five on the roundtable discussion of managing expectations is one of the things I find myself uh, doing fairly often with our execs because um, there is a desire for us to obviously be effective and efficient and not spend too much money, but do it fast. And so there's all these things going on that you're trying to say, well, we want to do all of that, but we have to be wise about how we do it and how we think about it. Yeah, for us, I think it's there's the expectation is that because you've got a number of uh, the industry hype, uh, because of the number of people out there that are that are pushing uh, everything from log aggregation and learn and machine learning around what it can do, uh, you know, the the outcome is this, right? They think we're we are applying AI or ML type technologies to reduce the 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 MTTR or the length of an outage, uh, overall the impact of an outage. We, we should be using it to do that, learning each time. Uh, we should be able to use AI and ML to predict when an outage is going to happen. So prevention, so outage prediction and prevention is somewhere where there's an ex. I mean, I hear this all the time in, in terms of the expectations, like what are you doing around this? Because every single time somebody like, I don't know, McKinsey, Lloyd, Accenture, anybody else that gets my uh, CIO's attention for 10, for five seconds, tells them all the stuff you could be doing and millions can be saved. And, and they're not, I mean, the, the management the leadership here is not, they're not st- idiots, right? They're not stupid, but they just kind of flip the question over to you and ask you, hey, I heard about this. What are we doing here? I heard about this. What are we doing here? And it could be because the CEO is asking them that as well, right? But it, there is a there there is the expectation that it's out there in the marketplace. They're, they're, everybody's familiar with the hype cycle, but there, there's, there's, an, there, there's enough, um, I'll call it momentum out there with enough companies uh, uh, making money doing this that they believe it's not just snake oil, right? That we should be able to do something demonstrable with it. We should have, uh, I like the one and two, right? Or at least with two, with the picking the right success metrics. It's like, we should be able to have some, I think the expectation now is that I should be able to have some metric that I can point to, whether it's MPTR, P1, whatever, and show where I'm applying some type of automation to affect that metric. That is harder to do, or it's proving to be harder to do, than I then then most people expect or most most people understand and that expectation is hard to manage. Well, you know, I, mean, I hate to, to be too contrary, but you know, in some ways, I think a lot of times people outside IT, I mean, they really don't care what the technology is. I was on a discussion earlier this week about like um, executive perceptions about DevOps tools and DevOps techniques, and are we sophisticated enough? You know, if you're building something, frankly, everybody else outside of the engineering function. They don't really give a flip. They just want to know, like, you know, we're getting features out faster than the competitors or we're able to blunt some kind of a new startup by mimicking their capabilities in the first three months they were competing with. You know, those kind of business questions are the way they look at things. So, you know, if, like the MTTR, well, if, there's, if there aren't any anomalies in a way or, and, and there aren't any significant anomalies that reach their level of attention, how IT is taking care of all that stuff in the background, you know, I, I don't think that... Most of the time, they're not technology advocates. They're not probing. Now, the CIO is going to, you know, maybe ask some questions, but I don't know if the head of sales or, you know, the head of HR or the head of marketing is going to be wondering what we're doing over here. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, again, I'm sensitive to time. I know it feels like we're we're just getting started, and you know, we could we could definitely go hours. And, uh, uh, but in the interest of having some next steps, I told you one of the Hopefully, the the biggest value you'll get out of this session is meeting each other, and so I'll um, I'll, I'll circulate uh, your contact information and happy to share these slides if you're interested. Uh, and then, uh, you know, just want to make sure we've we've at least seeded some conversations that that you can have offline, so you can be good resources for each other. One of my favorite quotes, I think it's more more true now than ever. The pace of innovation has never been as fast as it was yesterday, or as slow as it will be tomorrow. And to me, that kind of, uh, you know, in one pithy statement summarizes kind of where we're at. Um, I'm quite, quite bullish on the future. Uh, and with that said, uh, we're at the top of the hour. Really just appreciate you making time for us and uh, hopefully get value out of this, not just from, you know, this short hour, but uh, from conversations that uh, it turns into. 